right, here we go. Welcome to the Launched at Home Forum for middle school and high school parents and guardians. But of course, if you're an elementary parent, we welcome you as well. My name is Mariel Milano, and I'm a director on the curriculum and digital learning team. One of my areas of focus is supporting families with digital curriculum. I'm joined today by Ms. Lisa Simonitis, who's an instructional coach with exceptional student education, and Dr. Arlene Peters, who is the director for multilingual services. Each of us will be presenting information and will also be available for questions at the conclusion of the session. Ladies, would you like to turn on your cameras and say hello with me? Hi, everyone. We are here. We are real people, we promise. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see everyone, but I can't see you, so I'll picture you in my mind. <laughs> All right, here we go. The purpose of this event is to share information about digital resources and the day to day experience of general education students and English language learner and ESE students or exceptional student education students in a general education classroom participating in the lunch at home model. To make this as realistic as possible, we'll be experiencing this day through the eyes of a fictional seventh grade student participating in the Launched at at Home program. His name is Scott. He is in a seventh grade class with other general education students, but also receives services for English language learners, or as we call them, ELLs, or, and he also participates in the Exceptional Student Education, or ESE, program. To get his day started, Scott selects the Canvas app on Launchpad at the time the first bell at his school normally rings. Canvas is like his virtual school building. Then he selects his first period course tile from the Canvas dashboard. Each tile is like a virtual classroom. Then he clicks on the live lessons button to access the link to the web conference for the day. This is like a lesson in the classroom. During his live lessons and independent work, he will use G Suite for education apps like Google Docs. These are like virtual tools or school supplies for his courses. Scott will also have digital textbooks, which he can learn and interact with. Let's take a peek at how his day starts. Scott, like all of our OCPS students, starts his day on the Launchpad dashboard, which is like their neighborhood of apps that they visit throughout the day. It also contains a special backpack of tools and books for use in each class. Let's take a look at what a day for Scott as a launched at home student might look like and how he will use these digital tools throughout his day. Scott charged his laptop overnight. He grabs breakfast, gets dressed, and goes to set up at his desk or hard surface for the day. When he opens his computer for the first time, he always does three things. Check his email, log into Launchpad, and log into Canvas. This helps him make sure he hasn't missed any messages or announcements. At this time, students with disabilities who also participate in the general education classroom alongside their non-disabled peers may require visual supports to help them remember all the things they need to do to prepare for the day. This is just one accommodation that may be provided to support their learning. To remind ELLs of best practice routines, Mr. Smith provides a visual of the most important things that students should do at the beginning of each class. While Mr. Smith, the teacher takes role, Scott responds to a wellness check that asks students to examine their thoughts and feelings about wearing a mask this summer and now in school. For his L's, in addition to verbally start stating what they should be doing, he, he uses his body language to demonstrate his expectations, total physical response which includes hand movements and facial expressions. He also writes a simple sentence on the smart board and adds a picture of a mask. 
Exceptional student education or ESC teachers may be on hand in the classroom to also provide prompts. This service delivery model is referred to as support facilitation, where partner teachers collaborate to support students with disabilities during their content classes. An ESC teacher may also provide student support virtually during a BBB conference running concurrently in the ESC teacher's own Canvas course. This collaborative instructional model often takes place during small group instruction through rotation stations. Students then share out their response to the wellness check. Scott begins his day in English. That's his first period class, where they're currently reading a passage in Springboard. Students evaluate research sources for authority, credibility, timeliness, and purpose and audience. They learn to distinguish between primary and secondary sources, and they evaluate a website's content and identity to determine the appropriateness of a source. Mr. Smith introduces the lesson and then asks students to read the passage and annotate the text using on-screen highlighters for Read and Write for Google. Mr. Smith works with those students that need additional assistance using key vocabulary in comprehending the text in a small breakout room. Alternatively, an ESC teacher may navigate the room assisting students with an accommodation tool available as a Google extension to help with providing access to the text, highlighting and annotation ability, read aloud features, and vocabulary assistance through the Read and Write for Google app. It also has a translation feature for ELL students. This extension is available for all students by clicking the purple puzzle piece in the top right corner of the screen. Fluency in the use of this digital tool is essential in promoting independent learning for students who continue to struggle with accessing grade level text due to their disability or limited English skills. For his L's, Mr. Smith uses a graphic organizer where he includes key concepts in each section. Authority, credibility, timeliness, purpose, audience, primary sources, and secondary sources. As students read and highlight, they may copy and paste evidences of each in the appropriate section of the graphic organizer, or they may add pictures, symbols, words, and phrases from their reading. They will later use this information to evaluate a website's content and identity to determine the appropriateness of a source. Mr. Smith explicitly models examples for ELL students. If a bilingual power professional is available, he or she may be assigned to help students as they navigate through the text. Then Mr. Smith calls everyone back together to the larger audience where they share their screens so that they can see and discuss each other's annotations. Students answer comprehension questions independently, which require them to think critically about the text. Mr. Smith monitors the screen to assist students and ensure that everyone is participating. The support facilitation teacher or SFT may also monitor and assist students who are participating virtually by creating a BBB session breakout room to support individual students with specially designed instruction aligned to the target skills currently being addressed during face-to-face -face classroom. An example of this support might be to have students watch a quick tutorial on how to use the Read and Write for Google feature to create a personalized vocabulary list. Let's take a look at what they're watching. This video demonstrates how to use the vocabulary tool in Read and Write for Google Chrome. The vocab feature allows you to create a vocabulary list from individual words or terms. To use in a Google Doc, just use the colored highlighters to highlight individual vocabulary words. Then click the vocab button. This will automatically create a new doc in your Google Drive containing a vocabulary chart. It includes dictionary definitions, images from the picture dictionary, and an extra column for notes. Mr. Smith 
has already identified key vocabulary words that he knows his ELL students will have difficulties understanding. He provides them with the word, the student-friendly definition, the sentence or sentences from the text, and a picture or a symbol of the word if applicable. He adds the page number and paragraph where the sentences are found in the text. Later, he will have students write their own understanding of the key vocabulary after they've had a chance to read and discuss the text. Depending on the literary element, Mr. Smith provides L's with clear definitions and examples since figurative language, such as idioms, can prove to be extremely difficult for L's to understand. The ESC teacher enhances the identification of terms for both ELL and ESC students by modeling the use of the vocabulary list created in Read and Write for Google by adding a column which allows the students to cite the text where the term was used. Students learn to add a picture to the vocabulary list that represents the meaning or their meaningful connection to the new term. Scott's second period class is Chorus with Ms. Rodriguez. Today, they're working on a new piece together. Ms. Rodriguez models the first stanza live and the students unmute their mics and repeat after her. After some feedback on the new piece, it's time for students to do their own independent practice. Each student is asked to practice their scales and upload it to Canvas so the teacher can review and provide specific feedback. Scott isn't sure how to do this, so he sends Ms. Rodriguez a quick chat and she explains further how he can do it. Scott is not alone. Others need help too. To assist L's and students with disabilities with how to record themselves and upload their recordings, Ms. Rodriguez provides a simple step-by-step -step gift in her course for students to follow if they get stuck. Once students get the hang of it, the teacher can provide them with audio feedback quickly. Let's listen in as Ms. Rodriguez reviews and provides feedback to one of Scott's classmates, Julia. Okay, let's see what this student's recording looks like. Hmm. One, two, ready, go. They did a great job. Let's go ahead and leave them some feedback. Great job. I love how crisply you move between each note and you didn't allow yourself to slide. Keep up the good work. Let's make sure it's saved. Great job. I love how crisply you move between each note and you didn't allow yourself to slide. Keep up the good work. Perfect. Then Scott has a lunch break. He picked up his lunch previously and he has enough to last the entire week. His parents are working today, so he chats with his friends and makes a few calls. He decides he doesn't wanna sit at his desk this afternoon, so he moves to a quiet spot on the floor. Scott's third period class is civics. At the beginning of class, Scott's teacher conducts a wellness check by asking students to write about how inclusion and acceptance can be implemented in an online environment in Google Jamboard. An ESC accommodation, Scott is encouraged to bullet out his responses using the predictive text feature in Read and Write for Google. The predictive text feature will help Scott complete his writing assignment in about the same time as his peers but his individual education plan requires that he be provided extra time should he need it. Then students share out their different ideas through the Google Jamboard. And we can see how Scott is doing this on the screen now. 
Next, his civics teacher provides a lesson using iCivics. Scott is taking notes offline in a notebook on the video they're watching so he can be ready to answer questions when the teacher calls on him. Later, he'll take a picture of those notes and upload them to Canvas for his teacher to review. Once again, Scott is encouraged to bullet out his notes using Cornell style. As an accommodation, he, his teacher has provided a digital template in Canvas for him to make his own copy and complete as a kind of guided note. He's encouraged to use a timer at the top of his screen to remind him to pause the video at set intervals of two minutes each so that he's reminded when to stop and record a note. He will bring his notes to his learning strategies class during seventh period so he can review and reorganize the notes as needed and with the help of his teacher. The civics teacher provides a simple guide and an outline of the civics, iCivics lessons for L's. Students also receive a list of key vocabulary with student-friendly definitions, pictures, and sentences using the vocabulary words in context. The teacher also guides students on how to play the games that correspond with the lesson. L's who are Spanish speakers can access the games in Spanish. The teacher makes students aware of this feature in iCivics. Scott's fourth period class is algebra. The teacher, Ms. Snow, is modeling how to use a computer simulation to model and graph mathematical equations. He takes notes and then completes the computer simulation in a breakout room with his partner. In lieu of the partner breakout, Mrs. Vogel is the support facilitation teacher for this algebra class. She's working with a small group of ESC students in a separate breakout room. This separate room link is for a conference session in Ms. Vogel's Canvas course. She's already provided the link to most of the students with whom she works regularly, and she sends the link to those ELL students who are working with her for the first time. Once Scott's algebra teacher, Mrs. Snow, finishes modeling the concepts, Mrs. Vogel will invite students to join the conference in her separate course. Ms. Snow provides Elle's visuals or pictures that they can refer back to in order to model and graph the equations. Also, she provides cognates of key math academic vocabulary to help students better understand the math concepts. As the students log into the Canvas course, Mrs. Vogel poses a question about comparing the cost of cell phone subscriptions and asks who would like to pay less for their service. Mrs. Vogel then shares a quick video review of the steps to graphing equations. She sets a timer to alert students to pause for notes and questions and to model time management skills. In other words, we have two linear equations uh, like this. X, y equals negative x. Then she uses the embedded whiteboard to model use of the process as it relates to cell phone costs. Mrs. Vogel demonstrates the use of the online application graphic calculator, Desmos, to solve the problem as well. Students are encouraged to use the Desmos calculator as an accommodation. She takes notes in the margins of the whiteboard while emphasizing new vocabulary. She asks the students to connect with the content by describing other examples where they might find similar uses for the graphing of equations. She asks the student if they would like to try sharing their screen to solve a problem. Scott shares his screen and gives it a shot. He is assisted by a peer who also has his microphone turned on. The problem is solved using the slope procedure, and each student has their notes to refer to during independent work. ESC students are encouraged to share notes in Google Keep as practiced in their learning strategies class. Scott's fifth class is Comprehensive Science 2, my favorite. It is his teacher's favorite class, and today he's using a Nearpod to help students investigate. Today, they're taking a virtual field trip to a skate park. This will help them get ready 
to do a virtual lab simulation to better understand the concepts of force and motion. For ELL students in MJ Integrated Science, the teacher can enable closed captioning if using videos in Nearpod. This will help students to see the text along with the video to aid in their comprehension. Like his ELL peers, Scott benefits from the closed caption features as an accommodation. Ramps are everywhere and they help us with everyday things. They can help you get up into a place. They can help you get down or out of a place. They can help you get up a staircase easier. They can help you move heavy objects or move heavy machinery. They can also help you get into your home. Ramps can also be used for fun. And if we're talking fun, there's no place where the ramp is king like a skate park. Scott also uses the student note-taking feature in Nearpod to practice taking notes digitally. Since he struggles with toggling back and forth during the instructional slides, he's partnered with a student who is participating in the Peers as Partners program. This student, Angela, comes to his science class to help him and two other students when they need assistance. Angela prompts Scott when he should write something on the Nearpod notes. She also shares her screen to model the note-taking features so that Scott knows what to do and how to navigate the slides. He will use the immersive reader feature as an accommodation to help him with accessing the text when he's recording his virtual lab findings. Describe how you manipulate the experiment and what results you gathered. Then, restate your initial hypothesis and explain if it was correct. As an additional accommodation, Scott is provided the links to download the virtual field trip and the online lab so that he can return to them as needed. His science teacher understands the need for extended time, and she's very flexible when providing access and submission deadlines. Scott's sixth class is physical education, and by now he's ready to get up and move. Today, the coach is working through a series of Superman moves with students. This lesson is perfect for ELLs, the teachers demonstrating how the exercises should be done correctly, either personally or through this video. Southwest Middle School, I need your help. Metropolis is under attack from Lex Luthor, and I need you to help me defeat him and save the city. Now we're going to do some activities, some exercise activities that are going to make you stronger and faster, just like me. But don't worry, kryptonite is not going to affect you like it does me. So the first one we're going to do is going to be high knees. We're going to do 20 of these, one for 10 per leg. So we're starting now. Good job, superheroes. All right, the next one is going to be named after me. It's Superman. So we're going to come down here. And we're going to lean forward. There's one through the other leg. Lean forward. Two. See, I'm going at the picture because I jump so high. I usually jump over buildings. Jump to number four. You can jump as high as you can. Six. Keep working on this, Jim, guys. Seven. Eight. Nine. All right. The next one is going to be squats. This is also going to help you. Arms out. We're going to squat down. We're going to do two of these. Two. 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, nice job. The last class of the day is learning strategies. This class is comprised only of students with disabilities who need explicit, specially designed instruction in executive functioning and metacognitive skills. Scott logs into the Canvas course for learning strategies the same as he would any other class. The same teacher who helped Scott during his general education classes, Mrs. Vogel, teaches this class. In that way, she can support him with generalization of skills whenever she works with him in the general education setting. Today, Mrs. Vogel is modeling the use of digital sticky notes to remember quick deadlines and assignments. She does this in the context of the standard for self-advocacy and self-determination, reminding students about things creeping up on them and the need for time management. After Mrs. Vogel is finished with her direct instruction, students will begin working independently and in small virtual groups. Students are encouraged to bring work from their general ed education classes so that they can use the content from those classes to develop fluency and strategies. Mrs. Vogel has set up two breakup ro breakout rooms for collaborative sessions where students will work on the Cornell note-taking and vocabulary mapping skills. Mrs. Vogel pops into the rooms periodically to ensure that students are remaining focused on the task at hand and using the timer to manage their discussion. Scott is participating in the vocabulary mapping break breakout room. Along with his peers, he's using the vocabulary map template found in Read and Write for Google. Scott is in charge of monitoring the time. They're working collaboratively using a Google document which was automatically generated from the civics text where the group identified terms to include in a vocabulary list with pictures and examples to make connections to the new terms. When complete, the shared document will be copied and saved by each student so that they can each refer to it upon return to their civics class. One minute before the timer sounds and the breakout room ends, Scott reminds his team that they need to share the document. They use Google Keep to share it. Next, the students return to their independent work until they are called to data chat with Ms. Vogel, something she does with a few students each day. Scott works independently on taking notes from the last few minutes of the civics video he was watching during third period. Mrs. Vogel invites him to a brief private video conference to discuss his current understanding of his assignments from other classes. Scott joins the conference and update her, updates her that he is almost done with civics and then returns to his desk where he will complete his independent work. He knows that he will need to consider whether or not to add strategies he has acquired to his digital portfolio later in the week and he makes a sticky note reminder on his desktop. After his last class, Scott makes sure all of his assignments are complete, and then he plugs his laptop in and charges it for the next day. So now you've had an opportunity to see a fictional experience of our student Scott. Now it's time to let you check out some of the actual learning taking place in our OCPS schools. In this brief video, you'll see some of the strategies highlighted in our presentation in action, and we'll take a look at the instruction in our lunch dead at home and physically distanced brick and mortar classrooms. Welcome. This video is intended to highlight the vision of instruction for OCPS schools in the launch it at home, blended, and face-to-face -face with physical distancing models. In the launch it at home model, students learn while at home. In the blended model, some students learn at home and others are at school. And in the face-to-face -face model, students learn while physically distanced at school. As it is in traditional face-to-face -face models, teachers establish rules, routines, and procedures and practice these with students. In the three examples that will be shown, the teachers set up rules and procedures for students in the classroom, 
and at home. So we type respectfully, we stay on topic, no texting language, please. I encourage you to participate and then we should be successful today. All right, remember our folders come up here. Do you have anything in there? <laughs> okay, so person A, you share first, and this is your sentence starter. I think the three most important words are person B, you just have to listen politely. Then person B, you share out your. OCPS teachers value the social and emotional well being of all students across all models of instruction. Teaching in all models requires establishing relationships building a classroom community, and setting the conditions for social and emotional learning to occur. In these classrooms, social and emotional learning is evident across all learning models. So we're checking in through the poll, and I will project the results as they come in. So as you get to the site, you'll see the question at the top is, how are you feeling today? So as our results are coming in, it looks like we are all having a decent day or better. Let's share out. Um, what's the benefit of checking in with ourselves? We're going to think. We're going to think. If I could wear one color, just one color for the rest of your life, what color would it be? It looks exciting. Let's think. Hi, my name is Miss Kitchens. And if I could wear one color, I would wear yellow because it makes me happy. Can you guys wave to me and say good morning, Miss Kitchens? Good morning, Miss Kitchens. All right, Jacqueline, we're going to start with you today, okay? Go ahead and say your name. And if you could wear one color, what would it be? In all three models, standards-based instruction remains the primary focus for learning. How is Manaya going to be able to sort those shapes? Teachers gauge the progress of students in the classroom in order to make decisions about teaching and learning and identify needs within their classroom. Some ways teachers can monitor student learning include responses in chat boxes, within collaborative documents, and student responses of a verbal or written format. In the upcoming examples, the teachers are checking student progress in the launch it at home, face to face, and blended learning models. Jacqueline's all about me posters. Let's listen and learn a little bit all about Jacqueline. Where do you like to go with I like to go to with my family. Collaboration remains a priority in our schools. There are multiple ways teachers still provide opportunities for students to share and learn from one another through collaboration. These are with physical distancing in the face-to-face -face classroom or with a multitude of digital tools that can be used for students in the classroom and at home. In this example, the teacher utilizes a physically distanced turn and talk, breakouts, document collaboration, Nearpod, and other digital tools to support collaboration may also be used. To support student learning in OCPS, teachers continue to engage students in standards-aligned collaborative learning opportunities and social and emotional learning in the launch it at home, face-to-face, -face, and blended learning models. In addition, teachers make instructional decisions through monitoring student progress in all models to ensure academic success for all OCPS students. Okay, so what are your key takeaways as a parent? One, lessons are a balance of teacher-led, collaborative, and independent work. Two, small group instruction can and should occur when needed. And three, read and write for Google and the Textel PDF reader are available for all students. 
make sure that your child is logged into the Chrome browser with your OCPS credentials to access it. And finally, the Microsoft Immersive Reader is available in Canvas and in Nearpod for all students, irregardless of if they have an accommodation. So now we have some folks available this evening to be able to answer all of your questions. Not only myself, Lisa, and Dr. Peters, who you've already met, but Ms. Stephanie Weika from the Professional Learning Department and Ms. Danielle Barney from ESC Policies and Procedures. This particular individual is indicating that the live lesson is uh, with participants, but the students not able to enter the lesson. What, what can they do? So there's a few reasons why this might be happening um, in your school. If the teacher is using big blue button, then potentially it could be that the conference was started prior to your child enrolling in the class. And for security reasons, the conferences only invite students who are enrolled in the class on that specific day that they start. But don't worry, there's an easy fix. You can ask your teacher to end the conference, not click the X, but actually end the conference. And this will allow them to basically restart because BBB is a first come first serve kind of system like a buffet. So whenever you end it and start it again, it gives you a new place in line and invites everybody in the course back in. So simply ask the teacher to end that conference and restart a new one and they should be able to get in easily. Now, if the child is uh, using Microsoft Teams or another session and they're not able to um, join or they're not able to find the link, Another thing I recommend is asking the teacher, and you can do this by sending the teacher a quick email through the student's email account. Every student has a Gmail account, and that's their student number at students with an S dot OCPS dot net. They can simply go to their email account, email their teacher, and ask their teacher to email them the guest link. Then they'll be able to join that way instead of through Canvas if they're having some sort of technical problem. Um, and so if you're not getting a response from the teacher, because perhaps the teacher is in the middle of instruction and isn't seeing it, um, then my next suggestion would be to call the school. The school has a method by which they can go into the teacher's class as a Canvas administrator and send you a guest link. So call the front office and let them know that you need a Canvas administrator to send you a guest link to the live lesson and make sure you give them the teacher teacher's um, name and the period of instruction that you are trying to access. Um, here's another question. It says, are children still getting credit by using their audio and not utilizing their webcam? So um, this is an important question and it deals with attendance. So right now, um, our policy is that all students need to attend class regularly on the same bell schedule as they would during the school year in face-to-face -face instruction. And that means that students need to be present at the time the bell rings. So if they are uh, not present in the session at the time the bell rings, then after the tardy bell rings, they would be marked tardy. So how do you know if you are present? Well, the easiest way, of course, for a teacher to tell if a student is present is for their video camera to be on just like mine is now. That allows them to see that they're physically present and engaged in the lesson. Now, of course, after attendance is taken, it depends on the activity, whether the teacher will want the video camera on for that lesson um, in its entirety. But we do ask that students have their web cameras on if they're functioning for uh, the attendance purposes. Now, if your child's webcam is not functioning, there's a technical error, it needs to be updated, whatever the case is, they can simply put in a student tech request and there's an icon for that on their launch pad, or you can get to it at studenttechrequest.ocps.net, and this will make sure that there is a record on file that there is an issue with your child's webcam. If there is no issue with your child's webcam and the teacher asks for the student to put it on, it is expected that they put it on. If there is a specific issue that your child is happen having, since every family is different and we know that every home environment is different, simply reach out to your child's teacher and explain what's going on and they can work with you for the best solution for your family. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, in this particular case, the parent is uh, experiencing that the son is, uh, her son is saying he's one of the few folks that's keeping the webcam on the whole time. We heard that earlier today as well, and that some parents were frustrated because their child was um, really engaging as the teacher was asking them to, and other children were not. So definitely reach out to your teacher with those concerns. And if you're not able to get those resolved, reach out to your school administrator, and they can work to create a school-wide policy for what that acceptable web camera use looks like in your community. All right, let's see. It says that there is a sixth grader who is having issues logging into class. Sometimes the internet is perhaps a bit sluggish, and then they're marked late if they are trying to get into class because of technical issues. So that's frustrating, right? Earlier today, I was having an issue where my video was just spinning and it was driving me crazy. And I know if I had been a student in that moment, I would have been worried. So a few things to remember. One, make sure, especially after lunch, Lunch, that your child logs in a few minutes early to that next class. As the day goes on, we know that the internet, like everything else, including I-4, seems to get more congested. So it takes a little bit of extra time. Do not have them wait to the last minute to get into class, because just like when all the students are rushing through the door in the hallway, when all the students rush through the internet at the same exact moment to get to second period, it can get a bit crowded. So starting a little early, especially if you know the internet in your home is a little bit weak is helpful. Second, is if you are truly having an issue where you see that your student has been trying to get on for five or six minutes and it's just not working, I recommend stop and you know take a pause, take a deep breath, restart the computer, and then simply email your child's teacher as their parent and explain the situation. You know, most people will deal with that in a reasonable manner and simply accept that your child may have been tardy due to a technical issue. Now, if it continues to happen happen day after day, you can understand why from a teacher perspective that might be frustrating as they're trying to get their lesson started and it's frustrating for you as a parent as well. In that case, I recommend reaching out to your school and requesting a hotspot to support that internet experience in your home. You can get a, an application for a hotspot at digital.ocps.net and there's also additional information there about low cost internet options for families, which may provide stronger internet access for your child in the home and be able to allow them to connect um, a little more easily. In addition, I would recommend making an appointment with your school's technology support representative so that they can double check that everything's working okay with the uh, wireless adapter on the computer and that there's no issues on that end that are causing things to go a little more slowly. All right, so another question is, um, so it looks like you have requested a hotspot and you're on the waiting list. So definitely follow up with us again. Um, and I will give you my email address at the end. Don't worry, we do have plenty of hotspots available and we can certainly work to prioritize that for you if that's an issue for your family. And we're actually getting more hotspots in in October as well. So don't uh, leave tonight without getting my email address and we'll definitely make sure that we, we assist you, okay? All right, in addition, um, there's a question here about what what happens if a teacher starts class late and ends class early. Okay, so I want to get more information about what you're asking about, but in general, right, teachers like students should be available when the bell rings for class to start their live lesson. But teachers are just as different as our students, and each one of them may have a different structure for their lesson. For example, some teachers may start with students going online to Canvas and completing an independent work um, product first, and then log in about 15 minutes later and to engage in a live lesson for a few minutes, then go back off and do independent work, so on and so forth. So it is not a requirement that students are sitting engaged in a lecture for 45 or 55 minutes. In fact, that wouldn't have been a good idea even in face-to-face -face instruction. We want students to have a combination of whole group instruction, small group instruction, and independent work. And that independent work time may not be on camera. So that's going to depend on your in individual teacher. So if you feel like your child's getting out of class early each day, an important question to ask both your child and the teacher would be, 
what is my child supposed to be doing with those minutes? Maybe there's an assignment in Canvas they should be looking for. Perhaps there was a direction that was sent via a course announcement or an email to your child that you might not be aware of. And it's going to be important for you to kind of close the loop with the teacher for that. Now, if after you've uh, spoken to the teacher, you don't get an answer that you feel resolves your concern, definitely reach out to your school administrator and they can help guide you through the process. So there's a concern here that for um, ESE students in high school, so those students who are in the, the mainstream classroom, the experience in, the, in their opinion is not looking for an ESE student like what was shown tonight. What advice would you give a parent who feels like they're in that situation? I can speak to that. Um, this is, of course, one example of a day in the life. And so consider that there are a number of variations in instructional models, uh, blended, face-to-face, -face, hybrid. And um, what was presented here this evening is just an, one example. So um, that said, in addition, there's differences in IEPs and what the um, level of support is based on the IEP. I would urge you to contact your child's teacher first, particularly their ESE teacher or support facilitation learning strategies teacher once you have their schedule and find out how accommodations and scaffolds and specially designed instruction is being provided and what your child needs to do to um, work with the teacher to make sure that they're getting the specially designed instruction they need. Um, you are welcome to contact me and I'll put my email address in the uh, chat box or Danielle Barney, um, but our first line of contact would be the site and the school teacher. I'm not sure what you're seeing, but we can discuss this further when you contact me and um, if I can't resolve the issue or help you as a liaison, I'll be happy to forward that to Danielle. Does that sound like a good idea, Danielle? Absolutely. Um, just to kind of add to what Lisa said, um, each student has an individualized educational plan that is unique uh, to their needs and based off of where they're currently functioning in their school setting. So there definitely will be differences in the supports and services um, and sometimes the curriculum the students receive um, based on their unique needs. And I think Lisa is right um, to start out with the ESC teacher. Um, and also, if you have any additional concerns related to IEPs themselves or to the service delivery model or to the types of supports and services they're getting that are individualized for their IEP, um, you can always contact the school staffing specialist and request an IEP meeting to address your concerns as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, ladies. That's really helpful. What else might you suggest? Um, in terms of something that perhaps they might be able to work on at home. The parent is feeling like this feels more, more like virtual school for their child, so maybe not as interactive. Can they get the, there, there was a really good teacher tech tip that came out this week, thank you very much, Marielle, which uh -huh. talked about five different ways to uh, structure in uh, virtual instruction, whether blended or um, just virtual alone. Yeah. And I think the key takeaway for that was there's no model that is uh, teacher directed for longer than 30 minutes, just to summarize for you. So mm -hmm. it, it really um, depends on which structure the teacher is using, whether it's 20, 10, 20, or basically it manages the time for the teacher and chunks out instruction. And, um, you know, that's the teacher's professional judgment, but never should a student just be um, sitting at the computer staring without any time for collaboration, whether that be uh, virtual on one end and face-to-face -face on the other end, or face-to-face -face between two students, which is what you saw in the video for secondary students. Um, there's a number of different ways. And again, I would urge you to make your first line of contact with the teacher so that they they know you're on it. and. Uh, I would urge you to use that first line of contact as quickly as possible to make sure that everybody's on the same page with regard to instruction. Again, you're welcome to contact me. The email is in the chat box and um, we'll see what we can do to help you further on a more individualized basis. Perfect, thank you so much. 
So before we go, we want to share two things with you. One is you may not be aware that we have a OCPS launched at at home official support for families Facebook group and that group right now as of this evening has uh, many hundreds of families in it. I'm excited that so many have joined and if you want, you may want to take a picture of the screen or you can search for it on Facebook. There you can find a community of family members just like you who are struggling and experiencing the same things and the same celebrations so you can support each other. In addition, in that special space, you'll also have access to all of us on the call and be able to get direct parent tech tips and videos and support articles so that we can help you the best we can through this process as well. And we can be kind of that, uh, I believe the term Lisa used was a liaison and I love that. In addition, we have our um, digital.ocps.net website, which has all of our getting started resources for all families in the district, whether face to face or launched at at home. And there you'll also find a link to our um, parent tech tips. If all else fails, you can also email us at digitallearning.ocps.net. Now, I want to be clear, your first line of defense is always your child's classroom teacher. They know your child best. If that doesn't work, please reach out to your school administrator with your concerns. They want to help. But we also know that there are some things that are just beyond a school level. Maybe they're systemic or it's something you just don't feel comfortable bringing to the school. In that particular situation, please email us. We also want to be there as a support for you. And you can do that at digitallearning at OCPS.net. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.